Rebecca Warner, and I'm here to tell you about sustainable enough gardening. So what's sustainable gardening? My definition is that it imitates natural processes. Do you think we should have less? Yeah. It Im imitates natural processes, it emphasizes cycling of materials, and it minimizes waste and energy use. This is a slide of my sustainable enough garden in May. A lot of my pictures are of nitty gritty brown stuff, so I threw in some garden shots to liven it up. What's sustainable enough gardening? My idea is that if you're a home gardener and you can't garden full time, you have to choose your priorities. You can't change everything all at once. So what I'm gonna tell you about tonight is some easy first steps you could take to make your garden more earth friendly. We all know that there are environmental problems all around us and sometimes it's hard to see what one person can do, especially one person who's busy with work and family responsibilities. So I have good news. What we do in our gardens can make a difference for the environment. Each of us has a small impact, but together we can do a lot. So here's the talk that I have planned. I'll focus on four topics. First of all, some simple ways to make compost and improve soil, and I mean really simple. Second, easy ways to make mulch from free materials that you can find close to home. Uh, next, uh, easy time-saving way of preparing beds for your animals and vegetables in the spring, soon. And last, a quick recipe for non-peat potting mix, potting mix without peat moss for your containers. Uh, my garden story started with very conventional practices. My dad taught me how to garden. He was an excellent vegetable gardener. And back in the 1950s and 60s, he used all the usual tools of that time, the chemical fertilizer, the pesticides, those big bales of peat moss. And he was an excellent digger. I can remember watching him turning the soil with his spade in the spring. So when my husband and I bought our house, I started my own garden, and by this time I was combining what I learned from my dad with some things I've been reading about in Organic Gardening magazine. Over the years, with a lot of mistakes, trial and error, I came to realize that some of those techniques I learned at my father's knee didn't turn out to be necessary, and some of them actually weren't that good for the environment. Now we know that the fertilizer, the pesticides, even that, those bales of peat moss do have environmental consequences. This is an example of one of them, algae overgrowth in a pond, which was caused by fertilizer running off people's land. And if you're wondering about the uh, peat moss, I'm going to explain. So I think that Gardeners are natural environmentalists. We're outside observing nature closely. We want our plants to do well. Uh, we just need to adjust our approach so that we can put our environmental principles into practice and still have pretty gardens. With that goal in mind, I have redefined my garden approach over the last five years. And uh, that's why I named my book The Sustainable Enough Garden. It's the story of being on the path towards sustainability. I'm not there 100%, but I'm on the road. Uh, and now I aim to foster a beautiful garden that's also a thriving plant community. And I found out that I can do it without the chemicals, uh, without the peat moss, and even without a lot of that heavy digging. So, Compost was one of my first goals when I started my, oh great, is that better? Can you guys see that? Okay. Um, was one of my first goals when I started my garden. I wanted to make a compost pile. We moved in on Halloween. So uh, I'd been reading ads in Organic Gardening Magazine that said you can make compost in 60 days, 30 days, maybe 14 days. So how hard can it be, right? 
I went outside a week after we moved in to start that compost pile. And what materials should I use? Well, that time of year, there were a lot of leaves on the ground, so I started with that. I made a rectangle out of leaves. I sprinkled on some soil, kept making layers like that. And I have to admit, it didn't come out looking like a, a box, like the ones in the magazine. It sort of looked more like a sand dune. But my hopes were high. And the next spring, I went out there and plunged my pitchfork into that pile fully expecting that I was going to harvest some of that black gold that I'd been reading about. Well, of course, that didn't happen because no decomposition had taken place. I didn't have compost. I had a pile of matted leaves. Well, I hadn't followed that recipe for lasagna composting. I was supposed to be alternating the layers of green, high nitrogen materials like young weeds or grass clippings with brown, high carbon materials like those fall leaves. And I was supposed to be monitoring the moisture level of the pile, watering it when it got too dry, which I wouldn't have known how to judge at that time. And I was supposed to be turning it. Some writers said to turn it as often as every week. I hadn't done any of those things. Well, why not? Uh, basically, because I had a life. I got pregnant, I had two young kids, and I, even if I knew that recipe, I wouldn't have followed it because it took too much time. When I got time to garden, I wanted to plant flowers. I didn't want to mess around with the compost pile. Also, where was I going to store those supplies of the brown and green materials? Our house was on a one-fifth of an acre lot. You know, we put in that sandbox and swing set, and we kept most of the lawn for the kids to run around on. So I didn't have a lot of storage space. Well, 30 years later, I'm here to tell you that none of those steps in the lasagna compost recipe turn out to be necessary. You can make perfectly good compost without any of those steps. It just takes longer. And it, with that compost, it does do the job. You can have a nice garden with that. So fast composting is Hot composting is fast composting. That's what municipalities do when they turn our yard waste into compost. And in my town, they used to do that in windrows, which are these huge mounds, 12 feet high, 18 feet wide, and hundreds of feet long. They were turned by machines like this, and you can see that that compost did heat up because they, you could see the steam coming off it. With that system, with that volume of materials, you can make compost in a few months. But what you and I can do at home is cold composting. So here's the system that I've been using over the years. I, I run four compost bins, two pairs, two, two sets of two. And uh, they're made out of chicken wire, so they get lots of air. They're each four feet by four feet. Um, I found that it's a good idea to put down a root barrier so the tree roots don't grow into the pile, so I just put some landscape fabric on there. And through the season, I just throw my yard waste on there as it comes. No recipe, just as it comes. By the end of the season, it's pretty much full like that. Two of those, two of those bins are pretty much full. And that's all I do. None, no other steps. Uh, I used to think that that compost would be done by the next spring. That's not the case. I have to wait for two years. Two years after I put the last stuff on the pile, I've got fully made compost. And here's what it looks like. This, in this case, it's been sifted. That's why it has a finer texture. One reason that it takes longer to make compost in New England is our winters. My sister-in-law gardens in Austin, Texas, and she can make compost in a few months, but that's because the temperature there varies from pleasantly warm to unbearably hot. And you know, the decomposition is faster in, in hot weather. In winter, it completely shuts down, just the way food doesn't decompose when you put it in the freezer. So with my compost, I don't need to fertilize my perennial beds. And it does help my soil to retain water, which was particularly useful this year. I 
just want to point out what I'm not doing to my compost. I'm not turning it, I'm not watering it, I'm not taking its temperature, and I'm certainly not adding the ingredients according to recipe. If you do those things, that's good. I don't mean to put those things down. I'm just saying that you don't have to. You can get perfectly good compost without it. There is a limit to my cold composting system, which is that it doesn't heat up above 150 degrees, so it doesn't kill weed seeds. So sometimes I put some of my most prolifically seed-producing weeds out for the yard waste. And I know that in the municipal system, it will heat up over 150, so I'm not just sharing my weeds with somebody else's yard. So here again, the compost doing the job. Now what about closed composters? Are they faster? Not for me. I got interested in using a closed composter because of animals. For years, I used to just take my fruit and vegetable scraps and I would just tuck them under the top layer of the compost pile, thinking that the animals wouldn't find them, as if that's going to slow down any raccoon. But, you know, that was the hope. And then I heard about coyotes moving into the neighborhood. Do you all have coyotes? Yeah. So we were, people were losing cats and small dogs, and I learned that coyotes are omnivores. So an apple core that I put on the compost pile could look like lunch to a coyote, and I didn't want to be the one who's attracting a dangerous predator to the neighborhood. So I bought one of those typical black plastic compost bins and I staked it to the ground uh, pretty close to the back door. It, it happened to be one of those mild winters that we've had recently, so I was able to keep adding stuff to the bin through the winter. And the first thing that happened in the spring was that an animal chewed a hole in the bin starting from one of the ventilation slits. I never saw the animal in action, so I don't know what it was, you know, a vole, a rat, a chipmunk, I don't know. Uh, I tried to block off the hole by putting a broken flower pot on the inside of the bin. The animal just expanded the hole. So now I was putting out a smorgasbord for rodents. This is not actually a picture from my yard, but that's what I was afraid I would get. So the lesson I took from this was that if I was going to put food waste in a bin in my yard and have it resting on the ground, I was asking for trouble. I was either going to have to use a bin that was up off the ground like this one, the compost tumbler, which, as you can see, there's, in 2016, they were still making that still claim of 14-day compost. It never worked out that way for me. Um, or I'd have to use a completely animal-proof material. So by this time, I was pretty fed up. I didn't feel like buying another commercial product that wasn't really going to work. So I got the idea of using aluminum garbage cans as composters. I admit that they're pretty unattractive. But the thing I liked about it was that because it was a cylinder, I could roll it on the ground to mix the compost, which was, was I found it very hard to mix the compost in that plastic bin. So it's true I can do that. I um, had to poke holes in the sides for air, and I also poked holes in the bottom uh, so that I wouldn't have a soupy mess. And. Uh, that does work, but it's no faster than my open, open piles. It still takes two years for me to make compost in this system. So this is how it comes out. It's kind of crusty, and I chop it up and put it on the vegetable or perennial beds. So to me, this is a, you know, sort of a success. It's definitely animal proof. No animal has gotten into it. And I'm keeping that food out of the solid waste stream for my town. But as compost, it's not so exciting. Uh, so I can go on pretty much indefinitely about compost. Uh, I love compost, and there's less in my book about it. But why don't we go on and talk about mulch? So uh, I'm going to talk about two kinds of mulch that have worked for me, the shredded leaves, and down here is uh, wood chips. Everybody knows nowadays that mulch is a good thing. It suppresses weeds. It helps hold moisture in the soil. It prevents extremes of temperature. And if it's organic material like this, it'll gradually decompose and build your soil. 
These days, even McDonald's knows that it's a good thing to use mulch. So the obvious choice for mulch in my yard, again, was the fall leaves, because I had so many of them. If I bagged them up and put them out as yard waste, which was customary in the neighborhood, I'd actually be interrupting the soil cycle, because I'd be sending out organic material that should be staying on my property, decomposing, becoming part of the soil. In, so it would make more sense from a sustainability point of view to use them as mulch. In nature, of course, when leaves or branches fall from the tree, they fall on the ground, they decompose there, and they become part of the soil. So if I'm sending them out off my property, I'm actually depleting my own soil because what the tree drew from the soil is not being replenished. So my initial idea is I'm going to just let those leaves lie on the beds through the winter. And I ran into two problems with that. First of all, in my neighborhood, it's really not OK to have any leaves in your front yard after the last yard waste pickup. Everybody's trying to have their yard completely clean and leaf free. So that wasn't going to be popular if I had leaves lying around. But on a more practical level, I realized that those whole leaves didn't stay put. If I left them on the beds, they were going to blow around. So I invested in a leaf shredder, which is essentially a string trimmer and a drum. Plastic filaments whirl around in there, and they chop up the leaves into shreds. I still rake, but instead of bagging the leaves, I'm putting them, feeding them into that drum. And I think it makes a pretty mulch, and it doesn't blow around like the whole leaves. It's, I won't deceive you, it's definitely work to feed them in there. But one good thing is that I can just shred the leaves where I want the mulch. This, in this case, I um, put a plastic bag on there because I was going to save some for the spring. But most of the time, I would just let the shreds fall on the ground. I never end up with enough mulch to cover the whole yard. Uh, so here's a spot where I would ha had just put down some shredded leaves. It's a north-facing bed. It has some shrubs and perennials in it. And I've just shredded the leaves there and, and let them lie on the ground. Um, but I don't end up with enough leaf mulch to cover my whole yard. Back farther toward the fence line, I will let the whole leaves lie. And I recently learned that there's an extra benefit of that from a sustainability point of view, which is that beneficial insects are laying their eggs on those leaves. So if the leaves are undisturbed through the winter, then they will have the eggs will have a chance to hatch. I find that my leaf mulch disappears pretty fast. Within about a year, it's decomposed and it's disappeared into the soil. So that's a plus in that I'm improving my soil every year, but it's a minus because I have to replace my mulch every year. I used to buy those bags of pine and spruce bark mulch at the garden center or Home Depot. And if you've shrugged those bags, you know they're extremely heavy, and it takes an awful lot of bags to cover not very much area of your garden. Uh, but I still use those only in a spot where I'm really worried about the, the mulch blowing around because this blows around even less. So in this case, it's, it's next to a little garden pond, and I didn't want the mulch to blow into the pond. Now, in the last 10 years, I've been seeing this shredded wood mulch. What do you guys think about that? Do you like the shredded wood? <laughs> You know, it's a matter of taste. Um, it's most likely scrap wood from shipping pallets. And they have to shred it, and then they dye it in those colors that look kind of fake to me. Um, the red, the black, and the brown is supposed to look like bark. You could make the argument that it's an environmental step forward because it's reusing something that would otherwise be waste. But both the bark and the shredded wood have uh, environmental cost for the transportation, because they have to be, the shredded wood has to be processed, it's shipped to the big box store or the garden center, and then we have to drive it home to our house. So I found out that there's a free source of mulch closer to home, and that's arborist wood chips. To talk about the wood chips, I'm going to take a detour and tell you about Linda Chalker Scott. Uh, because she is a professor of urban horticulture 
at Washington State University. And she's the only academic who has compared different kinds of mulch head to head to test out which is the best. She found out that the wood chips were one of the best. They are very good for suppressing weeds, retaining moisture, um, keeping the temperature modulated. And they attract a diverse population of soil organisms, which is good, that, that makes for disease-resistant soil. So she said that uh, those were the waste product left over when people do tree work. And she said that you could just ask somebody who's doing tree work to give them to you, and they'd give them to you for free. I was skeptical about this. I thought, you know, Maybe this is a guy thing. I'm not going to have the secret handshake. But in fact, I finally asked a neighbor who does tree work, and he has been giving me free wood chips. He delivers a truckload, or, or even better, half truck truckload in my driveway. And he is willing to do it for free, because if not, he might have to pay to dispose of them, because for him, it's, it's waste. So once I've got those wood chips in the driveway, I just have to load them in the wheelbarrow and put them wherever I want. I find it's a lot easier than working with the bark because the wood chips are a lot less dense. So a wheelbarrow full is, is not very heavy. It's easy to maneuver. Um, I find that I'd like to do it at the, around this time of year. Here's the wood chips in the spring. This is around this time of year, very early spring, and I put them down on a path. This is hard to see over here, but by the end of the season, they've turned to sort of grayish brown. When I first saw them, I thought, wow, this is going to be really a design statement because they're so light, they're really going to stick out. But pretty soon they had weathered and they, didn't, they weren't so conspicuous. Uh, I found that the best thing about this mulch was when I checked out the soil under it. The first time I dug into it, I was really impressed because it was soft, it was moist, it really looked rich. Uh, you might have heard an urban legend that using a high carbon mulch like this will de deplete nitrogen from your soil. And Linda Chalker Scott did research this and found out that it doesn't happen. So it's okay to use the wood chip mulch any place in your garden except the places where you're going to plant young seedlings that don't have an established root system, like say, young annuals or your tomato seedlings. I like to use them for paths and around shrubs. I still prefer to use the shredded leaves on my perennial beds. It's, it's just my preference. This is a, one of my few south-facing beds, and it's fall, and I've just put down about six inches of shredded leaves. So next, I'd like to tell you about a huge time saver that I found out about recently, which is called no-till gardening. Are you familiar with that? It turns out this is well known in agriculture, and it's slow to come over to us gardeners. But um, you know, I was certainly raised to believe that you had to turn the soil in your vegetable bed or for your annuals in the spring, and the idea was that you were going to mix in whatever good stuff you were adding to your soil, your fertilizer, uh, compost, manure, and also you'd be turning under any weeds that might be growing there. Well, it turned out that when I was doing that, I was disrupting what's called the rhizosphere, which is the top few inches of soil, and that's where most of the biological activity is going on. In the rhizosphere, there are all these different soil organisms that are breaking down organic material into a form that your plant's roots can use. There are mycorrhizae, which are fungi associated with roots, free fungi, bacteria, nematodes, all kinds of insects. Uh, and they're all working together. And they're actually forming an architecture underground. They're forming networks. So when I was doing all that digging, I was breaking those up and working against myself. Two other ways I was working against myself that I didn't realize was I was introducing a rush of oxygen into the soil. And I used to look at my vegetable garden every spring and think, you know, last summer I knocked myself out adding all kinds of good stuff to this soil, compost, whatever, and it's still looking just like the sandy soil that I ever had. Why is that? Well, the reason was that I was 
putting in this oxygen, which caused the organic material to break down faster than it, than it needed to. So that's why I wasn't making any forward progress. The other thing I was, of course, doing was bringing weed seeds to the surface. So I, I found that that's where I had the most pernicious weeds, and this is not even the worst of them. Um, so I found out that the better way to prepare the beds was with a lot less digging, no rototiller. Um, it's just to layer the amendments, whatever you're going to use, on top, and in this case, compost, and let the soil organisms do the mixing, because they will do that. So this is my vegetable bed in April. In the fall, I put down a thick layer of compost, and I'm just going to plant right through that. So I just made my little furrows from my vegetable seeds. If I'm going to plant a seedling like a tomato, I'll just make a little hole with my trowel. You know, it's not what we were taught, but it's really working well for me. And I can testify that since I've been doing that, I've got a lot fewer weeds, my soil looks better, my plants are bigger and healthier, and best of all, my back doesn't hurt. So last, I'd like to tell you about an easy way to make peat-free potting mix. Why is that a good thing? I was certainly raised to think that peat moss is like the next thing to mom and apple pie. My dad definitely taught me to add peat moss to the vegetable beds, and it does help to hold water in the soil. And every bag of commercial potting mix that I bought was always made out of peat moss. Here's an example. You know, peat moss is the major ingredient in most of the potting mix that we buy. The problem is that peat is not a renewable resource, at least on a human time scale. Peat comes from wetland plants decomposing in very, very slowly in oxygen-poor water. In peat box, peat forms at one millimeter per year, one millimeter. So the peat that we garden with took thousands of years to form. So it's hard to imagine sustainably harvesting at that rate of growth. And when the peat is, oh, the other thing is that the peat sequesters soil carbon. It actually sequesters more carbon than all the trees in the world. So when the peat is harvested or burned, the carbon is released into the air, and the carbon sink that it provided is lost, and that contributes to climate change. In Britain, they are much more conscious of this. And in Britain, in your normal mainstream garden center, you can buy peat-free garden products. But it sort of hasn't gotten to us yet. You might have seen at your garden center or your Whole Foods these bags of organic mechanics potting mix. This is a company in Pennsylvania that's making potting mix out of coconut fibers instead of peat. Um, that material is called coir, C-O-I-R. I'm pronouncing it coir. Some people call it coir, so I just want to tell you, you might hear it either way. OK, so I could buy these small bags of organic mechanics, but I needed more potting mix than that, and I wanted a way to make some my, for myself at home without using peat. This is just a couple of ways I would be using my potting mix vegetables on the deck, and these are some of my tender perennials that I keep in the basement, and then I'm potting them up in the spring to get them started. So that had me asking, what are the qualities of an ideal potting mix? I never thought about that. It has to be dense enough to keep your plants from just flopping over, but, and, and it has to retain water and nutrients, but it also has to let water and air flow through. P has all those qualities, and it also decomposes slowly, so that's why it's popular. And compost would actually work for the same purpose, but it's too expensive for commercial use. So I found recipes online for making potting mix out of the coconut fibers, the coir, half and half coir and compost. And the coir I'd be using would be the last byproduct of coconut fiber processing. Here are the, the whole coconuts. Here are the long coconut fibers, which are separated out because they have industrial uses. And this stuff would be the last byproduct. I wanted to pass this around because this is the coir. 
so that you can see what the texture is like. I think it's just very much like peat moss. And so again, I'd be using something that would otherwise be waste. I could buy small amounts of choir from catalogs like Burpees, Gardener Supply, but I knew that I was usually going through four or five of those big uh, one cubic foot bags every, every summer, so I needed more than that. So I found choir at a, a hydroponic growing outfit. Um, I think that's the place where you'll get it cheaply. They have bags of loose coir like this stuff, and then they also have this, which is a compressed brick, sort of like those bales of peat moss. Um, this is five kilogram brick, and it expands into two and a half cubic feet of loose coir, so that would be like two and a half of those big bags. And whatever kind of choir you're going to use, you want it to have been washed to get out salt because some of it's been processed in seawater. And you need to wet it before you use it, which actually turned out to be really easy. You just can soak it in a barrel. It takes up water more easily than peat moss does. Now, you will have spotted the flaw in my potting mix plan, which is that we don't have any coconut palms growing in Newton. Uh, <laughs> Coir comes to us from tropical areas like Hawaii, so obviously there's a significant carbon cost for transportation. So that's an example of one of my sustainable enough decisions. It's not perfect, but I still think it's better than using the peat moss. Then the other ingredient in the potting mix is compost. You can buy a screen to, um, hold on a sec. to uh, sift it through. Can you still hear me? Yeah. Um, or you can easily make one out of some scrap wood and, and wire fencing. And here are my two ingredients, the compost and the choir. I mix it up in the, in the wheelbarrow. And I found that if I had any left over, I could just store it in a barrel with a lid so it wouldn't dry out. I like to keep some sifted compost in a barrel in the basement in case I want to mix up some extra mix during the winter. The real test of my potting mix was how would my container plants do with it? And I think they're just pretty much as happy as they were with the Coast of Maine products that I used to use. So if you don't have enough compost to make your own potting mix, you could make it with the compost that you buy at the garden center. But I think even more importantly, we can be the customers who go to the garden center and say, we want to buy peat-free potting mix because once they know there's a demand, then they'll, they'll supply it to us and the price will come down and we won't have to make it at home. So just before I close, I'd like to acknowledge the fact that we had such an unusual gardening season last summer with a record-breaking drought. Logan Airport measured 33 inches of rainfall in 2016, with an average being 44 inches, so we were down 25%. Uh, most years, I suppose probably like you, I haven't had to worry about having enough water for my garden. There are two reasons from a sustainability point of view to try to use less drinking water for irrigation. One is we might have to. Did you have a watering restriction last summer? Yeah, so. Um, but the other thing is that it turns out that making drinking water pure takes up a lot of energy. 3% of the energy generated in the United States goes for purifying drinking water. So the less of the drinking water we can use for irrigation, the more we're helping to slow down climate change. So I've started with some baby steps like this rain barrel, which collects the water just from this one downspout here, and then it feeds into a soaker hose in a bed in the front of the house. But that's, that's kind of a small thing. Even better would be to install an underground cistern to collect all the water that falls on the roof. This is a system at the um, Broadmoor Audubon Sanctuary in Natick. They built a new 
sanctuary building recently that's really state of the art from the point of view of a lot of different sustainability issues. And they um, use the south facing side of the roof for their solar panels and the north side of the roof, they collect all the water into this, oops, sorry, into this one downspout. It's going through a filter here to just collect out the leaves and dirt. And then there are these big uh, tanks that are, in their case, just half buried. They're not completely underground. And they're connected underground. So they have three of those huge tanks. They collect all the water that falls on the one side of the roof, and that is enough for all their outdoor water use. So that's pretty impressive. I calculated that if I could do that with both sides of my roof, I'd actually have as much water as I'm using in my garden every year. So, but the thing about that is to use rainwater for irrigation, you gotta have rain. So, of course, here are some just starting ideas of way, ways we could reduce our water use. First of all, adding compost and mulch are gonna help because they're gonna help your soil to retain water. Then it's a good thing, which we're all already working on, choosing plants that are adapted to your local climate, not just our New England climate, but the actual conditions in your own garden. And that may be native plants, but it actually may be plants from parts of the world that have similar conditions. And then the last idea, which I did not follow at all, but I wish I had, is to plant according to water need. So I've got a sprinkler system, and within one sprinkler zone, I may have some plants that need a lot of water, like hydrangeas. I may have others that really could get through the summer with very little. So that means I'm overwatering in order to suit the needs of the ones that need the most water. So in zero scape gardening, you know, where they're really paying attention to water conservation, they often create what they call an oasis around the house, which is the plants that need the most water. And then as they get farther from the house, they provide less and less or no supplemental water. And that's, a, that's one of their ways of saving. Okay, there's my sprinklers losing to evaporation. And uh, that's the end. I hope you'll be interested in some of these ideas and have a look at my book if you'd like some more. And if you would come up to the table here, I brought you a sample of my uh, peat-free potting mix to take home and give it a try and see what you think. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>